HBM2E. The E stands for evolutionary. Now, evolutionary not in terms of this evolving into a new type of beast. This really is not expected to be a bigger deal than GDR going to HBM or really even HBM going to HBM2. But at the base level, this should reduce costs a little bit, offer 33% higher performance, and allow 16 gigabytes of capacity in an 8-high stack. That's the standard. Now, that would mean a 1,024-bit card could have 16 gigabytes of HBM with the same bandwidth as Vega 56. But it will also reduce energy. And, in fact, it actually lets you go up to a 12-high stack. So more than 1,024 per package that you put on there. Guys, that could lead to 96 gigabyte cards in the ultra high end. And it doesn't stop there because Hynix is going to be ready at right out of the gate as well. And they say they're going to go for 3.6 gigabit per second. That's 50% more bandwidth per uh, stack, per 1,024 bit interface, right? We're used to it being you know, 1,024 in laptops, on a few token cards, um, 2,048-bit on the 14-nanometer Vega, and then, of course, 4096-bit. But again, if you have this speed in a 12-high stack, uh, you're getting to almost 2 terabytes of bandwidth, um, 96 gigabytes. And having these guys ready right when it comes out should keep costs down. Now, all of this really got me thinking. Right now, HPM wafers cost supposedly 30% more to produce than DRAM wafers, but they're charging twice as much. They're twi charging twice as much because HPM is so ridiculously in demand right now. But the potential is there. The potential is there for, let's say it costs, um, well, let me think, right? If it was like... A 16 gigabyte GDR6 card was like $96 or somewhere around there. Okay, well, $120 for 16 gigabytes of HBM. That's just not the case right now, though. It's over 150 because of demand. But once you get within 30%, it's just worth it. It's just worth it to use the HBM, even with the extra cost from the interposer. And with more people entering the market and entering the market of the newest version at the same time, it should, once supply catches up with demand, lower costs that little bit more. There will still be low-end cards for forever, probably, that you, or at least for the foreseeable future, that use GDR, even sometimes DDR4, DDR5 for... You know, because they just don't have that much of a bandwidth need, and saving 10 bucks on a $100 card is actually a big deal. But this is starting to point to, I believe, how we could see finally what it would take to get HBM in more than just cards above $500. But even more important, actually, than the raw cost of just the RAM itself is also the increased capacity, because 16 gigabytes should be the standard of even mid range cards in about two or three years. Higher capacities with bandwidth of a mid-range card in a 1,024-bit bus. Not a 4096-bit bus, 1,024. That means you could start affording to put it in the mid-range, which I think is very interesting, don't you? Very interesting that in a few years, four years, I don't think you'll see it below $200, but you could finally see like this, uh, you know, I think next year... We might get a 5750 XT, you know, that will be their refresh. But maybe in 2021, 2022, the 6700 XT, maybe that'll use HBM. And it might use it because it only costs 20% more to use it, leading to smaller cards, more efficient cards with enough capacity where they wouldn't have to decide if they want to nerf it to four gigabytes or something. That's exciting and incredibly exciting because when you clock these HBM cards low, their efficiency gains are even more pronounced because of how little energy the RAM is using. I know that even though at its base over volted settings, Vega used way more energy than the 1080 Ti, I saw a couple people do some comparisons where they found Vega 64 
if under volted to its max to you know 150 watts or no i think it was to like 120 watts only was about 10 percent weaker than a 1080 ti at 120 watts and that's just all the hb i'm doing the work there we could start getting lower clocked cards that are mid-range on desktop that use 150 watts, but then use like 50, 75 watts in a laptop, getting 5700 XT of the time, not obviously now, performance into 15-inch gaming laptops. That is going to be incredible. But now let's talk about the high-end implications for HBM2E and eventually HBM3. Navi23. NVIDIA killer. This seems actually like a pretty credible source they got here. I totally believe, I believe that AMD does have a card literally called NVIDIA killer going around in their workshops right now. And they would not call it that unless they really intended to crush NVIDIA. And the fact of the matter is that NVIDIA knows it as well because they are getting ready to launch a 2080 Ti Super. This will be that card I showed you guys a while back. You know, 12 gigabytes of RAM. The RAM will be 15% faster, and that 12 gigabytes means the full 384-bit bus. You know, like 20% or more bandwidth, and it will be overclocked by 10% or more. We're, we could get a 15% stronger card here, but here's the thing. NVIDIA is prepping this because they want to take on the 5800 XT. And when I saw that they were just going to do a Super Series refresh, I was like, okay, this is my lazy option. But they're not even bothering to call it a new series. And that means they think they can stay at least tied with or above Navi, even big Navi, by a little bit before they need to get to 7 nanometer been saying it on my channel for a long time that I actually think NVIDIA should have gone balls out, all the way out, made a bigger die, there's a little bit more reticle space on 12 nanometer, and made a full 30% stronger lineup to launch this either this fall, early fall is what I thought they should have done. Not bothered with any of this super junk, just drop prices below Navi right when it came out, and then let it you know leak that they've got a stronger series coming, and that's also why they drop prices. But that's not what they're doing. They think they have to compete with a 384-bit, 12-gigabyte card from Navi that they can stay above of if they overclock their Titan RTX by 10% and cut the RAM in half, which they can. They can compete with that. But it is my opinion that nvidia killer is not the 5800 xt now the 5800 xt could be an nvidia killer because i could see it being a full 40 percent or so more 50 percent stronger than the 5700 xt well staying right at about 300 watts and costing you know six to seven hundred dollars that is a 2080 ti killer right there and nvidia and that, again that's why nvidia is clocking their card to be 10 percent stronger so they can drop the price to a thousand bucks and say yeah but ours is still stronger so you know maybe they're charging 700 but we want you to pay that extra money for nvidia ray tracing and the fact that it's a tad stronger but in amd has a chance here to go for the kill Yes, the 5800 XT will probably be out at the end of this year and be ready and take on the 2080 Ti Super. But they are working on a bigger die. I know there's two more bigger dies coming at least. They will both have the new ray tracing tech. The 5800 XT is what's in the PS5. And the 5900 XT will probably use HBM2. And that could give it... You know, maybe they'll only make it... Ha like, so let's say the 5800 XT is 60 compute units. We don't know. But let's say it's around 60. That's kind of what it sounds like. Yeah, 50% stronger at most than the 5700 XT. No need for HBM. They're definitely working on an 80... Well, I would say a 72 to 96 compute unit. I think 80 or 88 makes a lot of sense. But they're going for that, you know, 5000 300 to 6100 sp mega card and i know people would say that uses 400 watts but no rdna2 will solve a lot of these power issues and if the 5800 xt uses 300 watts which it probably will or even just 270 250 who knows right 
going to that higher compute unit count, right? So another like 40% compute units. Well, normally maybe getting it to 350, 400 watts, throwing HBM in should again keep it below 300. And the Titan RTX actually uses 280 watts. So it's not that low power, guys. Having a 300 watt card with 32 gigabytes of HBM 2E at might cost $1,500, $2,000, but then beats the Titan RTX by 20, 30%. And they can charge that much. And don't worry, there will be a cut down version, maybe even with less HBM that they throw in at 900 or something. But when you hear NVIDIA killer, do not think AMD is just trying to barely kill the 2080 Ti. RDNA is impressive for its die size. They can double that to five to 80 compute units, and it's still not at the reticle limit at TSMC. They can go even higher if they want to. And they have no reason to not do that. They have the money. They are taking tons of data center contracts. They need something that can compete with Volta and Ampere, and this is what that would be. NVIDIA would be good to really rush that 7 nanometer along or something, or make a full 12 nanometer refresh with HBM if they can afford to sooner rather than later. The last thing I will say about all of this is what's going on at AMD? I got a couple of people who have now told me, uh, one of them who works at AMD, one of them who knows someone who works at AMD, and I know they're not the same person. It's not just a friend and the guy's friend. And the way it's described at AMD right now is that they're firing on all cylinders. They're a little more relaxed than before because they don't have a boot on their neck anymore. But they're relaxed in a way where if they're burning out, they're allowed to take a few days off. But they're still, like, plugging away. And that's because they are paranoid. Paranoid about Intel and about whatever NVIDIA is doing next. And so more money hasn't yet stagnated AMD. In fact, I'm told it's just making it a bit easier to work longer. And so again, Intel and NVIDIA would be good to not rest on their laurels at all. Obviously, Intel's in full freakout mode. Just some advice to NVIDIA. AMD wants every performance crown, and they want it now. And once they get it, they're going to follow up with a punch like we're seeing with Zen 2, and then another punch like we're about to see with Zen 3, and then another punch with Zen 4. Don't be so sure AMD isn't going to go for the performance crowns in every sector sooner than you think. They're just taking it step by step, but the steps aren't stopping. AMD isn't sitting still, so I hope NVIDIA doesn't as well. Whew. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. It was a little disjointed there, but the overall opinion is just kind of reminding you guys on the progression of HBM that it will have benefits to both the mid-range cards in a few years, but also the godlike cards in the coming year, and that no one should doubt the implications of how it can be used and how AMD is likely to use it considering they're firing on all cylinders. Please support me on Patreon if you have the money. Talk to me on Discord afterwards. Subscribe. Ring the bell button. Share. I still comment because I like talking to you guys on YouTube, though. And, you know, tell me what you think. Yeah, uh, I think a godlike card could really be interesting if it was actually godlike. None of these titans have been titans, though. But, God, if they just went all out and they kept it at 1,500, I think that could be cool. Because at least when we would talk about a titan, at least it would be a titan. I wouldn't buy it. But maybe I'd buy the cut-down version for 900 bucks or something. As long as I knew that was the strongest card that was going to be out from them for the next two years. And that I wouldn't look like an asshole the second they just drop something stronger for half the price. All right. Thank you. <laughs>